So, so my talk today is going to be all around um, what I perceive to be a policy and data disconnect. And there's a slight pun in that title there because I'm going to talk about address data in, in a bit of detail. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk um, chiefly to start off with about the One Scotland Gazetteer, which is our national address register and the successes that have been made of that data set. And then I really want to sort of drill down into different elements of data and, and how we can address um, various aspects of it. And I want to make this directly relevant to you policy officials so that you sort of understand that data isn't just something that data people do. It's something that we all need to consider in the round. So this is perhaps the first time you'll ever see a data set compared to a beer. But in my humble opinion, the One Scotland Gazetteer is probably the best multi-organisational data set within the country. And, and I want to explain to you a bit of, of why that is. So if you, if you think about the legislation and the policy around the um, address data or, or addressing per se, um, if you, you delve into the specifics of it and um, the the sort of individual um, pieces of legislation around it, it, it it's very simplistic. It, it's all about the basic responsibility for, for numbering and numbering of, of streets. And the key line in the legislation, which causes all the problems really, is the as they see fit um, element, which means that in, in Scotland and in England and Wales, each local authority has that responsibility, but everybody does it in their own specific and unique ways, or at least they did. So it's very much, legislation is very much the what without the how. And if you want to get a national perspective of that, it's a bit like um, a muddle up jigsaw puzzle like you see at the bottom of that screen. So what we um, were able to do in, in the start of the noughties really, around 2003, um, central government recognised that this was a, a big issue. And we received some modernising government funding money um, to the tune of about 10 million pounds that set out to essentially create um, a, a national address asset which could underpin um, improvements to public service delivery. So that was the, really the starting point for, for improving this sort of jumble of data. So the, the, the main thing that we had to sort out um, was, was some standards around all of this, this mess of address data. And, and luckily there were some British standards that already existed at that time. So what we did is we took those British standards and we turned them into what we called the Scottish conventions about how people should create addressing data. And we got all of the 32 local authorities to sort of adhere to those common standards and conventions. And an important facet of that was to, to create a sort of governance and responsibility network around um, adopting these standards. And we also needed to create a dedicated resource whose responsibility was to pull all of these different strands together. And we got the commitment from all of the individual bodies to sort of work collectively to, for, for the greater good, if you like. Um, and that meant that we could create a connected network. We could have regular forums with all these people that had these responsibilities and we could communicate with them and even sort of um, conduct training to, to educate people how to do things better around addressing data. Um, and one of the other big things that we were able to do, once we had a coherent national data set, it obviously became a lot more valuable than its component pieces. And Ordnance Survey recognised that and they approached us to enter into partnership with them to, to literally supply the One Scotland Gazetteer into their commercial products, address base and, and just recently highways. And that meant that they were then selling those products to the private sector. And for the first time ever, Scottish local government was receiving a revenue return, which we could then invest in doing things better. Um, one of the, the more recent um, developments is that we've managed to incorporate um, street data in with the address data and, and we're, we're sort of dynamically connecting those two aspects together so that we're essentially building a digital infrastructure that, that mirrors our physical world. What that really looks like is, is something like this. We're connecting every single address in the country to every street in the country. And, and once we've done that, we can append lots more data sets on top of this sort of digital infrastructure. And it becomes an incredibly powerful thing for for conducting analyses and, um, and improving services. 
Uh, and I've mentioned the increased value there, but we've obviously got massively increased use here now across the both the public and, and the private sector. And it's enabling um, us to do bigger and better things. These are the sorts of organizations that we're talking about. So now all of the emergency services have access to this rich standardized joined up data. All of our public sector are using these data sets. And then we put it into the hands of the information specialists and this is why you're able to get your deliveries via Amazon, because we have standardized addresses and drop downs and, and we make it very easy for people to be able to select the right address to to get things delivered in, in the right way. So I, I mentioned those commercial returns. What we've been able to do is, is sort of think, well, we've done that for address data. Why can't we do it for any other data that local government is collecting in, in its sort of day to day activities? So that's what we did. We, we built the spatial hub. And now we're able to ingest those constituent data elements for every, any data topic you might think about, transform them in the center and then publish them to national standards. And uh, just visually, um, we're able to sort of show people that the data exists across the country now, certainly the geospatial data sets that, that we collect. Um, and we're, as I say, we're doing this in a, a sort of standardized way so people can go in and access this data whenever they need to and stream it across the internet. So in, in, the, in our experiences of developing the Gazetteer and the, developing the Spatial Hub have, have taught us that we very much need to adopt a carrot and a stick approach to improving data. Now, if you consider yourselves in the room, policy people and legislative people as the stick, and, and the incentives that come from that, that good stuff that I talked about, um, the gazetteer achieving is very much the carrot, the incentive. Now we assume that that would be enough, but, but quite often people are so used to doing things in their own ways that it, it can scare them off and they can go running for the hills. So this slide in, in, in the right hand side, uh, this picture in the right hand slide, side of the slide is, is very much where I think we need to be moving to. We, we st we're still considering the stick as the policy and the legislation, but we need to tweak it, improve it, so that it comes with added incentive, the, the increased carrot, if you like. And, and we, we feel that by uh, improving and increasing the incentives, we'll have more people buying into what we're trying to do. And I think the, the slide was quite, quite good because it shows people still aspiring to get to the incentive. They're not quite there. And that's what I want to talk to you about in, in the last section of this presentation, try and unpick some of some of this and what needs to be done. So if we think about data in the realms of the policy cycle, we need to start thinking about what it is we value and why. So what I want to talk to you about with this slide is where I perceive that data the policy data disconnect. So if we think about the sort of utopian vision of, of a policy cycle, when, when a government comes into power with their manifesto, they have a lot of great ideas about what they want to do, and they turn that into policies. Now, what should then happen is, is they create resourcing and funding and perhaps a strategy about how those policies are going to be a, a reality. And they'll pass that on to a, a policy and service policy and service delivery agent like a local authority or, or a government agency. Now, if the policy hasn't really thought about what data requirements it's going to need that we can analyze to build an evidence base for, for retweaking the policy or working out whether it's actually delivered what it's set out to do in the first place, then we become a bit unstuck. And that's what I'm trying to show with this slide at the bottom of the screen. There's a bit of a disconnect there between the policy and service delivery and any analytics about it. So what we've been doing really is creating sticking plasters for that situation with the gazetteer and the spatial hub. Um, and, and yeah, and, and we're achieving some successes in doing that. But in an ideal world, we want to be thinking about the data from the off, from the policy development. So if we don't get the, the data being created well enough, I, I often show this slide on, on what we call the pyramid of, of the value of data and the data collection activities are, are at the bottom. If we get, don't get those foundations right at the bottom of the, the data pyramid, then any analytics and insight and ultimately decision making that we're doing towards the top of the pyramid could be fundamentally flawed. So that's why this, this sort of stuff is incredibly important and we need to get it right. So, um, 
Really, I guess what I'm saying, and um, this is a quote from last year, is that data will only ever be as good as the importance that is placed upon it. That's actually a quote that I came up with last year, and it was very much in the context of, of COVID. Um, the Public Health Scotland obviously um, recognised that they needed to sort out their data very pronto. And um, they, they've created this dashboard, and, and it's one of the most used um, website and, and dashboards in the country now. We, we've had 40 million hits on that and counting. So it just shows you that when data becomes valuable, people invest in it and then we'll start to get it right. So the next as aspect I want to talk to you about is data governance. And you as policy officials, <clears throat> excuse me, all have a role to play within data governance, whether you necessarily know it or not. If we think about a sort of wider perspective of, of why governance is so important, a lot of the times that we, we, we sort of think in silos and I, I've stolen a slide from a conference that I was at last year thinking about some of the big issues of our time and how they've been created by siloed mentalities and people not sharing knowledge and data across the piece. If you think about sort of modern engineering, that is the, the big contributor to climate change. If we think about chemical engineering, that's a massive contributor to plastic waste. And that has all come about because we've been sort of in this sort of siloed mentality. I have this job to do for this reason, not considering anything else. If you think about that in the local context, most organizations have a hierarchical structure where data and intelligence and knowledge may only ever pass up and down the chains of command and not necessarily across the, the, the different teams and the, and the different silos. So that causes, causes us massive problems. And we see that a lot in local government. And really, this is a far cry away from what Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the internet, was envisaging with his five stars of open data, where any piece of data or, or knowledge or intelligence could link together via anything else over the internet. So we need to be moving in that direction. So I, I mentioned that we all have a responsibility for data, that, and that's at every level. You know, at central government levels, we have chief data officers, we have head of digital, we have policy leads. Now, all of those people have a responsibility to be thinking strategically about data and, and how we make good data a reality. If we think about it, maybe more in, in the sort of local context, different people at different levels of the hierarchy, whether they're directors or team leads or operational level data people, they all know that they have a responsibility, but are we all working together sort of holistically. So what I, I would very much like to encourage is, is networks of, of people with a responsibility for data, getting their heads together, networking, working in forums to really work out what their particular niche is and what they need to be doing. So one of the, the other big aspects of this is data standards, how we achieve buy-in and understanding about them. I decided to go back to the drawing board with this and, and sort of look at what the different definition of a standard actually is. And, and very much standards come about by either by authority or by commonality and, and people accepting something that, that is common sense. So if we think about that in the real world, think about something as simple as a traffic light. It, it's a standard, but how has it come to, into being? And, and it turns out I did a little bit of research in this. Just one guy was responsible for creating that red, amber, green traffic light that we all know so well. But because it made a lot of sense, it was adopted by many people and it spread across the world. And there's probably a similar story um, around the three-pronged plug and, and why it differs to, to what we see overseas. But all of these are standards. And if we, we didn't have them, society would be in a little bit of a mess. And it's really no different with data. I've spoken a lot about unstructured data. If we, if we don't think about standards, we get all this unstructured data. And, and this is a slide that Gartner created a few years ago, and it suggested that really 80% of the data we collect is, is unstructured and a little bit of a mess. I like to think that the Gazetteer and the Spatial Lab are examples of, of more structured data that we've done a bit more thinking about. And that just shows that, that comparison. So what all this means is that unless we start thinking about this stuff, we're, we're massively decreasing our productivity. If we can't find data, we can't even start. If we can't access it, we're left frustrated. If we can access it, but it's not in a decent format or quality, then often we're back to square one. And if, if we can access it and it's the right data, but 
we haven't thought about how it can connect to anything else, then we often waste a lot of time and effort and resources. What that decreased productivity can mean is decreased economies. Again, this is another study by Gartner, who, by the way, is a, a data, um, data consultancy. It can destroy business value. They estimated that up to 11 million pounds a year can be lost from organizations by not doing data well. And a report from the cabinet office a few years ago suggested that just, just one small element of data that was, was being poorly done could cost the economy 500 million pounds. So we're talking about big sums of money here. So what we really mean by data standards um, is really three different aspects. The, so the semantics, the syntax, and the computer to computer interaction. Semantics are just things like describing data well. So creating common vocabularies and taxonomies for things that everyone adopts. So we're not calling different thing, the same thing different things. Um, syntax is all about sort of structures of data. If you think about spreadsheets, columns, rows, um, and how we do those and, and orders and things like that. And then computer, computer interactions is, is, is streaming things over the internet as we do um, day in, day out, but doing it in a more standardized fashion so that things link up. Now, the scientific data community trying to try and simple, simplify a lot of this stuff, and they have this acronym that's used quite a lot in data circles now called the, the FAIR data principles or data standards. And FAIR stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Um, the, the, the findable aspect is, is simply creating metadata records on the internet that can be found by Google key, keyword searches. Because if we can't find data, as I suggested, you, we can't start with it. Accessibility, I've already mentioned sort of um, capabilities of, of streaming data from computer to computer. Interoperability, that's creating things within data that allow you to stitch it together. So everybody is using those same connectors. And then with the reusability, it's all about um, that governance aspect, maintaining things, knowing that it's got to be done well and well managed and, and licensed accordingly. Okie dokie. So um, if everyone did fair, you know, we'd be in a far better place. Um, and I, I won't linger that point, but um, it's directly relevant to the things we've been talking about. Next slide, please. Just one aspect of interoperability. If we, we capture those individual linking points within our data, we can bring it all together and we can potentially improve citizen services and, and, the, and citizen outcomes, basically. So these things are incredibly important in the public sector. Quick on, on technology in, in procurement. We're talking a lot about the public sector here. Next slide. When we procure digital solutions, if, if we don't sort of incorporate standards in those solutions, then an anything goes approach happens. So this is an example from the planning sector. Just one small field in, in a standardized software product, because we've not adopted any standards, every local authority will input into that field however they wish. And from a policy perspective, now we can create rules about procurement that enforce people adopting standards with their technology solutions. So we should really start looking into this if, if we're spending so much money on these solutions and they're so important in the, in the public realm. Um, one aspect we need to think about as policy officials is telling stories with data. So we need to start thinking about how we can um, engage with our audience using clever visualizations. This is an example of local development policy, um, local development plan policy. We can combine different mediums together to engage an audience, to tell people about lived experiences in certain places. You know, we need to embrace those new, new solutions that maybe the youngsters are using that we're not using. And we can get better at telling stories through um, dashboards and showing how policy is impacting um, trends. And we're seeing a lot of this, especially in the advent of COVID. And then there's a place for sort of interactive blogs and, and data literacy and telling a story and explaining things to people. And we've had to do a lot of that with COVID, explaining what the R rate is to people. Next slide. This is an example from the ONS about talking about deprivation and, and taking people on a story and, and looking at specific aspects of, of data and, and, and really drilling into why they're important in, in our national context. Um, Final couple of aspects that I just want to mention briefly, data maturity. So we all recognize as organizations that we need to improve on data. 
Uh, another example, um, another sort of survey that Gartner conducted, looking at the blockers in terms of data. Well, really, the ones that came out top were all HR related issues. And policy people can affect those and improve them. So we all need to be thinking about what it is we can do in our organizations to, to improve these HR related data issues. And some of us will have big changes to make and others will be more progressed. We want to get away from this picture of, of just data protagonists in a room with surrounded by screens and data and have data at the heart of the decision making process within every organization. So we need to be, I want everyone to take away from today, what is it can, that they can do to affect change in their organizations? Final few slides. So the last thing that I want to leave you with is, is the concept of data principles. So in Scottish local government at the moment, we, we've created a set of draft principles that we think are pretty good. They're, they're very much aligned to what the Ordnance Survey are doing, who are a great example of a data organization. And I'd very much encourage everyone else to start thinking about principles for their organization and, and what it is they can all sign up to and do better. So sorry about that. Um, I may have gone on a little bit longer than intended, but we had a few technical glitches. Um, but yeah, happy to take any further questions on any of that.